Good morning. My name is Doug. I'm one of the pastors here at Community. And uh, as Kurt was just praying, uh, as we look for ways to see how God is interjecting himself and moving in our midst, uh, what we'll be talking about today is an example of just that, the way he moves and uh, in the midst of people and changes lives, changes the world uh, because of what he does when, uh, as his people walk in faithfulness. I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, and I just want to call attention to this. You know those young people up there that are starting that Bible study, that young adults ministry? Um, they thought of that, and then they came to us and said, is this something we're allowed to do? And we're like, yes, yes, how can we resource you? And so they're spearheading this. It's a brainchild of a small group of them, and they're wanting to see what God's doing in the young adults. And so God moves in his people. When he puts a path in front of us and we're obedient, he moves. And that, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, last Sunday, we started our Advent uh, series. We're kind of looking at the story of Jesus as it unfolds. We talked about how uh, he is the vine and we are the branches as we plug into him. And that gives us hope. He is our living hope. Today, we want to continue along in understanding Jesus' story uh, today, we're going to unpack another part of that. Um, today, we're going to talk about his mom. So, the word of God for us this morning is in, found in Luke chapter 1. And uh, we're going to hear about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Jump to verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, uh, when, you're, when you speak... Uh, when you give us your word, it transforms, it, it hits and impacts and things happen. And so we're anticipating that. It didn't just happen to Mary, uh, but it can happen for us too. We are also encountering your, encountering your word, a message that you have. So in this moment, may we hear, may we receive, may we be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so talking about Mary, um, let's first start trying to understand who this young lady was uh, because context matters. It helps us understand a little bit about what she was dealing with, what it meant for her to be in this situation. Uh, so who was she, Mary? Um, well, first of all, uh, she was a young lady uh, who lived kind of in the boondocks. She lived in the rural part of the country. Um, 13, 14 years old from a town called Nazareth. Um, not 
really in the important kind of area of the world. I don't know if you know where Nazareth is, but if you're in the Holy Land, you know, you've got uh, the Mediterranean over here, and you've got like the, the River Jordan, and over here is the Sea of Galilee, and down here is the Dead Sea. Uh, that's underneath, south. And there's like three counties that make up the Holy Land, and uh, G uh, Galilee is one of those. Nazareth is in Galilee, the northernmost county. Uh, down in the south is, you, is the county Judea. I call them counties. They weren't counties back then, but I call them that because that's how we think, right? We know Ottawa County. We know Kalamazoo County. We know Kent County. We know, like, and that's kind of what it was. It was this region, and it had a bunch of towns in it. And down south, you had Judea, and there was Bethlehem, and just north of that was Jerusalem. Yeah, Jerusalem, like the seat of all the things that were ever important. Important people dwelled among there. But then you go north, and you travel through the county of Samaria, which nobody did, by the way, but you did anyway. You're, you're going to go on this journey anyway because you're brave. You, you don't mind. And you get just north of Samaria into Galilee, and poof, you land upon a tiny little town called Nazareth. It's not near the Sea of Galilee. It's not near the Med. It's not near the river. It is nowheresville, backwoods country. Nobody important cared about it in any way whatsoever because nothing important ever happened there. And that's where Mary's from. Uh, in fact, a guy named Nathaniel in the Bible actually asks the question, uh, can anything good come from Nazareth? Which means that as a town, town goes, it probably had a bad reputation. And that's where Mary's from. Uh, she's a young girl living in, eh, I mean, harsh times. 2,000 years ago. Um, infant mortality was fairly high. Uh, if you made it past childhood, you were doing good. Uh, if you were rich... You could live lifespans that we typically see, 60 years, 70 years. But if you were poor, if you were not wealthy, as Mary was, uh, if you saw 40, you were doing good. And so this is the, the context she grew up in. She was a, a, probably a hardworking young lady. She worshiped the Lord along with thousands of other young women her age. Uh, many of, of those young ladies could trace their lineage through King David, just like Mary could. And so nothing spectacular there. Uh, her normalness as a human was just universal. It wasn't any different. Take a look around you. You see any of the middle school, high school young ladies who, who come to this church, Mary would have fit in just fine. You wouldn't have even noticed the difference. She was normal. This is just the way that it is. People are people. They've been people from the very beginning. They're still people today. The Bible, it, it, real life was not invented after the Bible times. Like the people we read about in the Bible were just regular folks. Uh, for instance, like Pastor Kurt likes to talk, to talk about, he's been talking about this for the last few weeks. He was reading a story about someone, uh, someone had written something uh, and he was reading it. They were talking about the teenagers around them, and they were talking about how, you know, their teenagers were just not listening to them, and they were kind of ignoring direction. They didn't seem to have a very good purpose, like what in the world are they supposed to do? And they were a little bit rebellious and kind of aloof and huffy. Um, I don't think they used that word, but the way they described it, we all know, right? We've, we've, we've been around teenagers who've been in a huff. Um, and he's like, oh, wow, this this." This could be written today. And he looked, and it was like written back in the 400s. Teenagers have been teenagers for thousands of years, right? Um, people are people. We're all normal. Our Bible heroes, the people we read about in our scriptures, are just normal folks. They were worried. They were angry. They were insecure. Uh, some of them were stubborn. Some of them were greedy. Uh, some cried a lot. And some were happy, and they laughed at jokes. And if they had an itch, they scratched it. Uh, they were just people, just like you, just like me, average folks going about their business, trying to be faithful and live according to God's command. And that's, that's hard. That's something we know. It's, it's not easy living according to God's command. If you're, if you're like any other normal person on this tiny little planet in this vast, vast universe, you realize pretty soon as you try and be faithful to the Lord that it's not easy. God has ideas in mind for our lives and, and ways that he wants us to go and paths that he wants us to walk. And oftentimes, that's not the path we want to walk because we have our own desires and our own ideas about what makes sense. And, and, and this, this thing, this fleshly nature that we have often feels a little rebellious and, and people have been people for forever. 
And typically our first impulse is to want to find a, a, an easy path, a smooth road. We want the wide, smooth road of life. We don't want it to be complicated. And, and, and we want to be able to, to just, you know, pull into our driveways and, and hit the button and the garage door goes up and we pull in and hit the button and the garage door goes down. And I, I don't know if you knew this, but you, you kind of live in a gated community. If you've got one of those, you live in a gated community and it's safe. You don't even have to look at your neighbor's. And there is nothing in our Bibles that would suggest that Mary's any different. She's a, a girl who has ideas about her life, who, who, who wants certain things and has hopes and dreams. So if she's not any different, what sets her apart? Well, I mean, we're talking about her, so there must be something different about Mary, something that sets her apart. Well... Mary matters because God had a task for her. He chose her. He chose her to be the vessel to bring the Messiah into the world, and he sent an angel to tell her that. Uh, verse 28 and 29, right? The angel says to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Let's just, let's just, just take a moment and unpack this moment of Mary's life. The angel Gabriel comes into her presence. And I got to tell you, that alone would have been overwhelming. I don't know how she didn't like pass out because we're talking about an angel of the Lord in her presence. Uh, just, just, just to give you a picture of this, uh, just a couple of verses earlier in Luke, that same angel goes and talks to a guy named Zechariah. And as he's talking to Zechariah, he mentions to Zechariah that I, Gabriel, continually stand in the presence of God. All right? No, that should matter. Like, what does that mean? Well, think for a moment back to your Old Testament. You remember uh, Moses. Moses, when he was out uh, walking the people through the wilderness, he would go up the mountain and he would talk with God. He'd spend 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord. What happened when he would come down? People would freak out because the radiance of the Lord shone from Moses' face after just 40 days of being in God's presence. He had to put on a veil, otherwise people were so intimidated by him like they would just, ah. And that was just from 40 days. Imagine, imagine if you are a 13 or 14-year-old girl and you're in the presence of a being that has been in the presence of God since the beginning of creation. <gasps> like how does she breathe? It is just staggering. And there she is in the presence of one of God's angels, a messenger sent from heaven, and he's got important news for her. And she's a good Jewish girl. She knows the stories. She's heard the stories of God interacting with people, of God doing things. When God says something's going to happen, something happens. When God says, I'm going to take care of you, God takes care of them. When God says, woe to you, oh, seriously, woe to you. And so she knows God is coming down. He's speaking through this angel. He's got a message for her. Something's happening. And this angel says to her, hey there, little miss, God's chosen one. The Lord is with you. And Mary is like, oh no, what does this mean? My life's going to get complicated now, isn't it? And she doesn't, well, she doesn't argue with God's plan. She asks a simple question, but she doesn't question God's will. Even though she must have, she must have known that living according to this command from God was going to change her life forever, things were going to get complicated. The dreams that she had, the ideas that she had about the path that she would walk, that most girls her age would walk. I mean, instead of God blessing her with a, a good marriage to a good man and maybe a few kids and, and, an, and an unremarkable life, instead God is saying, no, no, I'm going to bless you. And he blesses her with pregnancy before marriage. And he blesses her with the threat of death because of that, because it, it, well, there was a threat of the death penalty if that happened uh, back then. And then he blessed her with a husband that might leave her because she was with, well, not his child. 
And then the, the, the blessings that came from God as they continued along, as they had to get themselves to Bethlehem in time for the birth. And that meant traveling while very pregnant. And we all know how much that fun that is. Not. How many times do you have to pee? And then there's the, 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 the birth of the child in a manger. There's animals all around. It's probably not very sanitary. And then after he's born, then this whacked out leader guy, King Herod, decides, I got to kill this kid. And so, I mean, seriously, if you ever get a chance to do some history on King Herod, um, Herod the Great from the time of Jesus' birth, you will just be blown away at how psychotic this man is. He is like next level crazy. And he has turned his ire on her little boy. And so they flee. They pick up and they run to Egypt just to save his life. All of this, these, these, these blessings from God, far from her home country, far from everything she's ever known. And yet, you know what? It was a blessing. I'm not even being sarcastic about that. It is a blessing. Her life was blessed. Why? Because she got to be a billboard declaring the wonders of the God of the universe and the truth of the Savior come. That's her story. That's who she is. As God spoke his truth to her and she followed his path. And that's, that's what it means when God speaks his truth to his people. It is amazing. And it's disturbing. We are disturbed. We, what it means to be called the people of God means to be called to a life of disruption and disturbance. God calls us out of the places that we've been and asks us to move into the places we've probably never, ever considered. To make hard choices, difficult decisions, to follow the path of God means that we must lay aside the things we would prefer. And that's what happens, right? That's what happens. You get a word from the Lord and what he's going to do in our lives, and suddenly we know everything's going to be different, and we have to choose. Am I going to fight this, or am I going to accept it? And sometimes it's a little bit of both. I remember being called into ministry. I was on track to be a lawyer. I was about ready to head off to law school. And God says, no, be a minister. And I said, that's a dumb idea. Ministers don't have lots of money and don't drive Porsches. By the way, I'm a big fan of a good 911. Uh, the Porsche. Thank you. And I argued with him about it. I'm like, no, that's, that's a dumb idea. He's like, that's what I want for you. I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea. I said, that, that, he said, that's what I want for you. And I said, I said to my family, I said, hey, this is, seems to be what God is saying. And, and I remember my mother saying, oh, um, well, you know what, sweetheart? If you wanted to be a ditch digger, as long as you're happy. And I didn't know if that was like a compliment or... And I told my buddy from college, I'm like, dude, I think I'm supposed to be calling the ministry. And he laughed, and he goes, oh, dude, you're serious? I remember the first day at seminary, there was a young woman I knew from college who, was, who went to seminary, um, and I had gone to a different college. Uh, she, she had taken a different path, and, and, and we, we had kind of knew, she, she, I had a bad reputation in college. And we converged, and she saw me walk into seminary. She looked up, she saw me, and she's like, what are you doing here? But guess who won, right? God, God knew what we, knows what he's doing. He knows the path. Mary was shown the path that God, of God's choosing, and she, she elected to accept it. I am the Lord's servant, she answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the Messiah came into the world. This is his story found in the troubled experiences of Mary. The Savior of humanity was born even in the midst of chaos. Through Mary's story, we learn a vital truth. It comes into the light. It's something everybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus has to come to terms with. 
That Jesus is the good news that comes from suffering or trouble. That he's the only good news in the midst of trial. That he is the light in the face of any darkness. That he is the only hope in the face of our great enemy death. That the end goal of every path God asks us to walk is always Jesus. Always. Mary's troubles brought Jesus into the world. That's her story. That's supposed to be our story too. Mary is not remarkable. She's just a girl. What's remarkable is that God had a plan for her and look what God did. What's remarkable is that he put this path before her and it led to Jesus coming into the world. What sets her apart is the exact same thing that sets you apart as well. This is your story. You are supposed to be pregnant with the gospel. I, I said that to Josh this morning. I said, I, I, I think I'm supposed to challenge people to think of themselves as pregnant with the gospel. And he's like, dude, that's pretty good. I'm like, I know, right? He goes, that's weird though. I know, I'm no, right? Like, I'm going to say that. Are you pregnant with the gospel? Are you pregnant with the gospel? He's like, you know what would be really funny? I'm like, what? He goes, like, can you imagine a couple of guys from church later on this week walking up to each other in their workplace saying guy to guy, hey, dude, you pregnant this week? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you? Oh, yeah. Can you imagine what people around them are like, I don't know, those community reform people are weird. But we are, every single one of us. We are the carriers of the light of Jesus Christ. Everything that we go through, every path God has put in front of us is for the purpose of spreading his good news. And if one more person realizes their salvation because of a valley, because of a path, because of the way that God has asked us to walk, then we too have found favor with God and it was worth it. No, no matter what I've been asked to endure, no matter what any of us have been, no matter, no matter what the path it is that God has put us on, I want to encourage you to remember that you are actually no different than Mary. No different. Her trial, her path, and yours have the exact same purpose, which is the greatest purpose in life, to bring Jesus into this land. That's why you exist that's why she existed. She just did it physically. We do it spiritually, relationally, emotionally. And if you allow that to happen through you in your life, then nothing you ever endure because of the path God has put you on has been in vain. Your life gets to be a billboard of the greatest message ever given. You know what it says in 2 Corinthians? It says, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Do you know what that eternal glory is that far outweighs them all? You know what that eternal glory is? I'll let the Bible answer that for you. Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's being. Our entire life is about bringing the gospel, to bringing the presence of Jesus Christ into this world. With Christ living in us and through us, our life actually can shine brighter than an angel that stood in front of a little girl. To share the light of Jesus Christ in this world, no matter what path it is, no matter what you must endure, it is for that that God has chosen you. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, the, the stuff that you do in our lives is overwhelming sometimes and beyond comprehension and, and the paths that you put us on, uh, we don't always know how they're going to end, but that's okay. Um, we, we can't see the future, but we know that you can. And forgive us. Forgive us for the times that we fight you. For the times we think we know better. For the ways that we, we get in our own way. And give us the courage to walk the paths that you have given us. So that we too can carry the presence of Jesus into this world. By your spirit, you have put him here in us, living in us, through us. We want to be pregnant with the gospel for your glory and for the glory of his name, we pray. Amen.